Good morning. Welcome to worship today. And if you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, I am uh, Scott. I am not Art. Art is taking a day of vacation today. Uh, He was actually at first service, which I think says something about our church and about our people. If a pastor, even on his day off, decided to come on in and worship with us, Uh, He is gone now, though, so if you're trying to catch him, maybe give him a call this week in the office. I want to wish you a very happy Father's Day to all of the fathers here. Uh, The number one day for phone calls to be made is Mother's Day. The number one day for collect calls to be made is Father's Day. I hope you don't get a collect phone call. I hope your family treats you well, but each and every Sunday, it is our Heavenly Father Day. We're here to celebrate Him. Just before we do so, I wanted to uh, point out two things in the bulletin. As always, read the bulletin. It's an entirety. Uh, One is, if you're interested in becoming a member of the church, this would be the case if you're joining us online. If you want to be a member of the church, you can join our Inquirers class that is going to be just one night. It's Tuesday, June 27th. You can sign up on the church website or call the church office. Uh, And then the second one is, when you call the church office, please note one of the two uh, phone numbers that we've had for years we have gotten rid of. If you keep dialing and you don't get anybody, you've got the wrong one. You can figure out that way, or you can take a look in the bulletin. Either way, you'll figure out which number you need to take out of your contact list. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we are so excited to be here. This is your day. Let us celebrate with praise, with worship, and then a week of being obedient to you as a way of continuing our worship to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Who are we that God is mindful of us? We are here to thank our Holy Father for creating us and loving us in a way that knows no limits. Let's stand now as we resume worship and as we sing this next song. Ask Jesus to shape us and mold us into the disciples of Christ that he is calling us to be. I will follow. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. When you move, I You 
myself I'll send If this life I lose I will follow If you read the scriptures, you discover that David is many things. He is an amazing songwriter. He is a passionate worshiper. He is a genius military commander, and he is a very poor father. We just sang about our Heavenly Father, who is a good, good father. But this being Father's Day, we want to recognize not every father, not every parent is good. So we're going to take a look at the life of David, and I want to remind you that you can learn from somebody's example. It doesn't have to be a good example. It can be a bad example. You can learn from both. This morning, we're going to take a look at David, who was a bad example of what it means to be a father. Five acts in this morning's message. The first of those begins with David and Bathsheba. That's 2 Samuel chapter 11. It begins on a moonlit night in the city of Jerusalem. The country which had been at war with a neighbor seemed to be inching closer to victory. The enemy's capital was under siege, and the best general in the Israelite army was there on the front lines leading the assault. This year's military campaign, however, was going to be a little different than it had been in the past because David was not going to go along with the troops. He had decided to stay behind. Campaigns could drag on for months. Staying uh, in the palace had to be far more comfortable. David had a very large family, at least 10 wives, 18 kids. They were probably all demanding time. Would be a whole lot easier if he stuck around for that. And in addition to that, who wouldn't want to stay in the very city that they named for you? Now, all around the city, people were retiring for the evening. Children were being put to bed. Husbands were preparing for the next day at work. And some of the women would make their way to the roof of their house where they would take their baths as the the darkness would descend. And you didn't have to worry about seeing them because they would have short walls called parapets around the houses. So you could be a stone's throw away from your neighbor, not have any idea that they were in taking a bath. Now, along the palace roof, David is strolling along. His sleep had been disturbed. He either had insomnia, maybe a bad dream, perhaps the weight of leadership had kept him up. And so David is there walking around on the palace roof. He too is enjoying the light of the moon until something, or shall we say, someone got his attention. Looking down from the palace, which sat high above the city below, David could uh, see all of the homes of his subjects, and there in the moonlight, he sees one of his subjects. She would have had pale skin. She she would have had young skin. She would have had uh, beautiful hair curves, and all of it is entrancing David. He is finding it minute by minute harder to look away from this person bathing. He drinks in the view each moment, making it even more difficult to look away. And what he sees from the vantage point of the palace, only he can see of this woman. Now, last to stop in the story to say the following. Not all temptations are created equal. Some Temptations gather strength when standing in certain places. For instance, if you struggle with your waistline, no judgments from me, but if you struggle with your waistline, the buffet line is not a good place for you. If you have trouble with gossip, sitting with a gossip in Panera, sipping coffee for several hours is a no-go zone for you. 
If you have a lead foot, let me suggest your next car should not be a Maserati Gran Turismo for you to sit behind. Some places will bring great temptation. And by the way, those places can be different for different people. Some places and some people should be avoided. Avoid certain places. If you're dating, let me suggest you should never be in the back seat of the car, in a bedroom with the door closed, or at lovers lane at the end of your date. These are places that you should avoid in the first place. And by the way, I, I, I imagine this will be shocking. My parents had glimpses that I would have problems with my weight my whole life because I used to, as a kid, walk up to the refrigerator, open the door, and just stand there looking at all of the food. For me, standing in front of the refrigerator, the freezer, the pantry, or having a conversation with Wendy about what I would like to have for dinner are all dangerous places to be. Now, you can be standing in a place that is a neutral place, and it can all of a sudden become a danger zone. Didn't share in the first two services, but I can tell you that uh, Wendy and I live on a lake, and one night we discovered that the neighbors did not realize that when the sun goes down and your light goes on in the bathroom, you can get quite a bit of a view. When we discovered that, all of a sudden, the back deck was like, I guess we will not be going out there when the sun goes down. Here's the thing. Some places can be neutral, and all of a sudden, they can become danger zones. What do you do then? We're told of a story. Remember, Joseph, in the Old Testament, he's working as a slave. His master's wife takes a shine in him, and he discovers he's in the house alone. She grabs his coat. What do you do then? Well, in Genesis 39, we read, his master's, meaning Joseph's master's wife, grabbed his coat and said to him, come to bed with me. But Joseph ran out of the house so fast, he left his coat in her hand. Paul picks up this picture and writes about it in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, flee sexual immorality. You may remember in the King James Version of the Bible, it says that you should flee or, or avoid the very appearance of evil. You remember that? Avoid the very appearance of evil. By the way, that does not mean a situation that looks bad. That's an act of wisdom. You should avoid that place because of wisdom. But listen, that is not what that verse means, and I can prove it. Jesus was alone at a well with a woman who had had a series of relationships. She is a woman. She is a Samaritan. She has had a number of marriages. Her last one is not a good one, and Jesus is there alone. Could somebody think that looks bad? Absolutely. Did Jesus ever sin? Uh, thank you. I thought that, that's an easy one, folks. That's a different sermon. Okay. Jesus did not sin. Okay. So it can't mean that. What it means is every time that evil walks in the front door, you run out the back. That is what that means. You should, when, when temptation comes, you should run immediately, you should run fast, and you should run far. Second, you need to avoid certain people. You've heard the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. But the reality is, it's not just birds of a feather who flock together. It is that the birds that flock together begin to have the same feathers. Do you know how I know that? If we were to take all the married couples in this room, mix you up, and then show pictures of you to a group of people, they would have a pretty good idea of which two of you belong together. 
That is because you share the same diet, you go to bed at the same time, you typically get up at the same time, and by the way, you have spent years together. Okay, ladies, I know it's not been 50 years and you're still trying to make him look a lot more like you and it is not working and it would be better if he was more like you. But the reality is you become like the people you spend time with. So if you don't like the people that you are spending time with, if you don't say, I want to look more like them, I want to talk more like them, I want to act more like them, you need to find different friends. You need to avoid certain people. Solomon wrote, be with wise men and become wise, be with evil men and become evil. In our story, David stays and then he strays. One night of passion was followed by betrayal, lying, scheming, and murder, which brings us to act two. The second act is Nathan and David. This is 2 Samuel 12. The act opens up with a typical day in the palace, perhaps a day a year after David's infamous night on the roof. David is met by one of his closest friends. Nathan was a prophet. He wrote a biography of G of um, David and his son Solomon. He had a son who was good friends with Solomon. Nathan was an advisor. He uh, helped David to know how to build the temple and. This day, he walks in, he has a judicial matter he wants to place before David. He comes with a story. He says that there's been a traveler that has spent the night at a home of a wealthy Israelite, but when it came time for the wealthy Israelite to serve dinner, instead of serving one of the many lambs that the wealthy man had on his farm, he went next door, he took the baby lamb that was over there, kills it and offers it to the traveler. And what makes it even worse is this baby lamb was like a, a member of the family and it was the only lamb the neighbor had. So Nathan asks the question, David, what do you think that justice requires? We're told in the uh, scriptures that, G, or that David burned with anger. And David then quotes from God's requirements. You see, God had said in Exodus, whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. So he says, the man deserves to die. He needs to pay back four, four times. At that point, Nathan reveals that the case that he has just posited is a parable about David himself. You see, David had had many wives from whom to choose that night. Instead, he went and took the only wife of one of his 30 mighty men. That young lady, Bathsheba, was also the daughter of another of David's 30 mighty men. And she was the granddaughter of David's chief counselor, Ahithophel. David had chosen a woman related to many of the people of his closest circle and had committed sin. Now, before we move to the third act, I want to pause and I want to reflect on forgiveness. We're told in the passage of scripture that David immediately repents. Nathan tells him, you will not die. In other words, you're forgiven, but there are consequences to your behavior. When we sin, there are two results that are not related to each other that can come about. First, God sometimes chooses to punish us to get us to change. If you are a follower of God, he will always get your attention. The only question is, how hard does he have to hit me until I take notice? God wants to get you to stop your destructive behavior. He wants you to notice so that he can get you to change. But then there are consequences to our behavior. Now listen, 
Punishment is meted out by the creator. God can choose to punish you, but consequences are meted out by the creation. It takes no act on God's part for you to experience consequences. You may wonder if it's possible for you to sin and then to just go to God and you pray that prayer of forgiveness and then it's sort of this giant do-over. Why you can't just sin with impunity? Like, just go ahead and do it because all you got to do is pray. It is for this reason. You may avoid the punishment. You will not avoid the consequences. For instance... If you smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, you may end up with COPD, bronchitis, cardiovascular disease, or lung cancer. God does not actively strike you with these things. They just come about by creation. So David repents, God forgives him immediately, but there would still be consequences for David's choices throughout the rest of his life. And we want to notice one of those throughout the rest of the message. So we come to the third act. This is Amnon and Tamar, 2 Samuel 13. The third act opens with Amnon, the crown prince, who is sexually attracted to his half-sister Tamar. Now, while that was forbidden in Israel, it was very typical in the ancient uh, world. In fact, we know of pharaohs that married their sisters and had children. It was common practice. Tamar was the beautiful sister of Absalom, the prince who was third in line to the throne. The story itself is quite sordid. Amnon's cousin hands him the plan for how Amnon could have his sexual conquest, and Amnon then executes it flawlessly. But in the story, what is so curious is, after Amnon gets what he wants, he no longer wants what he has gotten. We are told that he loathes Tamar even more than he had desired her to begin with. So he throws her out of his house. Amelia Earhart once said, anticipation, I suppose, sometimes exceeds realization. And once Absalom had his conquest, he tosses her out. She leaves the palace a broken woman spending the rest of her life unmarried in the house of her brother, Absalom destroyed in body and spirit. There may, be more no ch- there may be no more chilling words in Scripture for a parent than the following. God says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. My actions set my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren up to either experience God's blessings or his punishment. Our sins often become their sins. The behavior they see modeled by us is the behavior that they often model. David committed sexual sin from the roof of the palace. Amnon commits sexual sin within its walls. A number of years ago, I did some continuing education as Part of uh, those studies, the small group that I was a part of, had to do what was known as a spiritual family genogram. Now, that's just a fancy word for a family tree that plots the uh, choices that people have made in our family. It was quite sobering, by the way. One pastor realized that his family had a history of people getting pregnant and having like having children out of wedlock and then secretly 
having those children raised by somebody else in the family. It had happened over multiple generations with multiple children. I sat at a table when I was in college with a young woman who told us that in her family, her great-grandmother had gotten pregnant before married, her grandmother had gotten pregnant before married, her mother had gotten pregnant before married, she had a sister who got pregnant before married, but she said, I am going to break the cycle. And a few years later, we discovered the cycle would need a whole another generation to be broken. She too had fallen into the same sin. Listen, would you make the same choices if you knew that your children, grandchildren, or great-grandchildren would make the same choices? Further, would you make the same choices if you knew that your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren would face the fallout, the consequences of your behavior. We have a tendency to think it's my business, right? My choice is my business. It doesn't matter to anybody else. But if you read the words of scripture, it matters because you can make the choices that other people live with. And on Father's Day, If we had time to interview everybody here, my guess is some of you would say, it's not my choices I'm grieving, it's the choices of of my parents or the choices my grandparents made. Some of you are in the driver's seat, some of you are in the back seat of other people's choices. We come to the fourth act. This is Absalom and Amnon. For two years, by the way, Absalom waits for David to confront the crown prince. Every day when Absalom awakes, he watches the hollow shell that is his sister. She no longer wears the ornate robe the virgin daughters of the king wore. Absalom reserves his words, and they are words of comfort for his sister. But inside, he is seething, but he says nothing to his brother, and that's not uncommon because we are told in the scriptures that David, when it came to his son Amnon, never told his son no ever. So why is it a surprise, right, when all of a sudden what Amnon wants is his sister? He's never heard no throughout his whole life. And by the way, parents... One of the most loving words in your vocabulary is no. Listen, Jesus said the road to destruction is wide. There are many on-ramps to destruction, right? Many on-ramps to destruction, which is why no tends to, with a parent, be the word that you say more than the word yes, Because we're told the way to destruction is wide, the way to life is narrow. So when your kids are young, they often need to hear the words, no. But it's because you love them. What we discover is that broken relationships don't mend themselves. Unconfronted conflict rarely gets better. Just because no one points a finger and calls it sin doesn't mean it won't do damage. Writing a thousand years later, the Apostle Paul said, Stop being proud. Don't you know how a little yeast can spread through the whole batch of dough? Paul likened sin to yeast in a batch of dough, but we could liken it to gangrene in an arm, rust on a car, Mold on a loaf of bread. If left alone, these things don't get better, they get worse. And the same is true with sin. The remedy is to deal openly and honestly with sin as soon as it is practicable and possible. Now listen, timing of your words is necessary. But taking your time to deliver them is not. Solomon, brother to both Amnon and Absalom, would later write, When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to do wrong. 
If you read 2 Samuel 13, you may wonder what the original, who the original target of the assassination attempt was. It ends up being Amnon who dies, but if you read the passage of Scripture clearly, you note that Absalom especially wants David to show up. Could it be that he wanted to kill David himself? Or was it that he wanted to show David, if you're not going to take care of the sin, I will? We don't know. But the issue is that Absalom is going to step in to this. David had withheld the justice, and if dad wasn't going to address the problem, then his son was determined to do so. And as the blood pooled under Amnon, Absalom makes his escape. And this is what the writer notes for us. He writes, Absalom fled and went to tell my son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. But King David mourned many days for his son. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. Now, it's important to note this. Talmai, king of Geshur, was actually Absalom's grandfather. Knowing that he would face punishment at home, Absalom runs to his grandfather for protection. And by the way, some of your children and grandchildren do the same. Children know which parent is the soft parent, They know if grandma or grandpa will take their side. You probably, they they probably have an aunt or an uncle that would do the same. Friends, family, you name it. Kids look for protection instead of repentance. Wendy's awaiting the first grandchild, her first grandchild, who should arrive in two months. Uh, By the way, she has had Grandma fever for years. I I am looking forward to this because then I just won't have to hear, I can't wait for a grandchild. She is so excited. She's heard stories from all of you, right? Grandkids are, are God's reward for not killing your own kids. I'm convinced of it. And when I talk to a lot of you, you guys tell me the best part of having grandkids is you get to spoil them and then send them home. Wendy's looking forward to doing that kind of stuff. She's picking out books. I I know she can't wait to pick out clothes, that kind of stuff. She's excited to do a little bit of that spoiling. Not me. I am not excited one whit for that. What really has me excited is I can't wait until our children have children that are just like them. That is God's reward for me. But here, you can do better. Listen, grandparents, you can do better. You have an opportunity to to do more than just spoil grandkids. You can influence them for the Lord, so don't squander it. Resist the urge to give them sanctuary when they do wrong. Pray for them daily. Be a bridge between them and their parents. Point them to Jesus. Live so that Paul's words to Timothy would be true in your family. Notice what he says about each of the generations. He writes, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Then we come to the fifth and final act. It's David and Absalom. The last act begins five years after Absalom kills Amnon. Absalom stayed three years with grandpa and then another two years in Jerusalem without his relationship with his father being properly restored. The scriptures tell us Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Same hometown, never the same room. Now, since the rape of his sister, the relationship between father and son has been strained. If you think about the chronology, it is seven years 
since Tamar was raped, seven years, and for seven years, David has done nothing to repair the damage done by his one son, addressed his inaction, or the poor actions of another son. He's even silent when Absalom burns the fields of his army chief of staff to the ground. It was only at that point that David made a move towards Absalom. But it seems, however, in the amount of time that took place, the damage had already been done. Within a short period of time, Absalom puts himself forward as a king who would bring justice to the people. His rallying cry to the people was, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that they receive justice. The son looks to his father for justice. The sands of time pass through the hourglasses day after day. David does nothing. Absalom has recognized his father's lack of character and if David won't address it, Absalom certainly will. So the plot is hatched and David is on the run. Absalom's army and David's army clash in a forest east of the Jordan River and about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The battle ends up a disaster for Absalom when he is left literally hanging by his hair. David had ordered all of the soldiers as well as the generals to grant leniency for his son. But unfortunately for Absalom, who should meet him in the woods but the same army chief of staff whose field he had burned to the ground. And although David didn't deal with anything for seven years, it took only a few minutes for David's army chief of staff to make quick work of Absalom out in the woods. The writer leaves us with these haunting words. David started trembling. Then he went up to the room above the city gate to cry. And as he went, he kept saying, My son Absalom, my son Absalom, I wish I could have died instead of you, Absalom. My son, my son. Parents, your children are a precious gift and an awesome responsibility. You will fail them many times as you raise them. But your failure won't take away your responsibility. Once you are a parent, you are always a parent. Parents, your children will fail many times as you raise them. Their failure won't take away the relationship. Oh, they might at times want to choose new parents, but, well, God chose you and he chose you for a reason. Always provide a way back when they fail. Your heavenly father has done that for you. You may have failed him many times, but he leaves the door open for you to come home. Listen. You can't help whether your child comes home or not, but you can help whether or not they have the map to know how. You may need to even spell it out to them. But do so for their sake and for yours. Let me pray for you. Father, it's tough being a parent. You know that. All your children but one were wayward. But you provided a way for us to come back home. For the relationship to be fixed. Father, help us to do the same for the most precious gifts that you give us other than Jesus, our children. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
soul is yearning for your living stream. My heart is aching for you. All that I long for is found in your heart. You are everything I need. You are the thirst. You are the stream. You are the hunger living deep inside of me. You are the food that satisfies. You are provision for the journey of our good God. You are everything to us, everything that we need. As we leave this place, may we live in such a way that we bring honor and glory to your name. 
someone to the foot of the cross. Let relationships be restored because we've been here. Let us live with purpose. Let us parent with love and commitment. Let us see a great harvest. You are good. In the name of Jesus, amen.